Uh, OK. Um, I suspect we'll have a very full uh, lecture this afternoon, so I shall start now. There are still a few empty seats at the front. If anyone's uh, standing, you can come forward. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to the second library lunchtime lecture of this semester. Uh, our speaker today, Dr. Emre Özgen, is the founding chair of the psychology department at Bill Kent, and his talk is entitled Language Learning and Color Perception. Uh, I should make a small request before we start, which is that, if possible, could you either switch off your cell phones or uh, switch them to uh, quiet mode? Dr. Emre Özgen uh, started his academic life, in fact, as an electrical engineer. He studied that at ITU for two years, then he switched to psychology. He received his BA in psychology in 1995 at Boazdi University, and then he moved to the University of Surrey, Guildford, in the UK, where he pursued his doctoral studies. He was awarded PhD, I think, in the year 2000. He stayed on at Surrey to be a postdoc and then lecturer. In 2004, he returned to Turkey uh, to set up the uh, psychology department here at Bill Kent University. In addition to his duties as chair and lecturer, he is also vice president of the Turkish Psychological Association. It may be of interest to you all that uh, Dr. Özgen is hoping to collaborate with uh, Professor Typhon Öztürk, a previous library lunchtime speaker from last year, uh, on a project relating to the quadrupedal families in eastern Turkey, and we hope that comes up. As a little bit of uh, side interest, a little known secret, uh, Emre, as well as uh, his academic career before he started out uh, as an academic, uh, he, he pursued a, a career as a rock star. He, he was the lead singer in the Turkish rock band Akbaba. Um, luckily for us, however, he decided to forego sex, drugs and, drugs and rock and roll lifestyle <laughs> for the equally exciting citation tea, lecturing and libraries lifestyle of academia. So we're all glad that he made that decision. His talk today uh, relates to the effect of spoken language on uh, how we perceive and how we describe colors. And this is one of uh, Emre's main research areas, and he's got a number of important publications on this topic. He will, in addition, introduce his talk with some more general examples from cognitive psychology. In order to give him a chance to speak, uh, I shall stop. I could go on till I am blue in the face, <laughs> but I better stop. I shall throw out the red carpet and give him carte blanche and the green light to speak. Okay, thank you very much, Emre. Wow, amazing. Um, thank you all very much for coming. That's uh, an amazing turnout. I wasn't expecting this at all. Um, OK. Although, uh, first of all, I need to say something, which is that uh, I may appear to be a little stiff. It's because I pulled my back muscle uh, a couple of days ago, and I, I can sort of hardly turn around like this, so don't think I'm weird. Um, <clears throat> and um, the second thing I'm going to say is that even though the talk is about my research in uh, color perception and the relationship between language and color perception, I want to start with something fun. And for that reason, can I have the lights down, please? Um, I, some of you will have seen this before. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I am repeating myself. But uh, most of you, uh, an overwhelming majority, have not. So that's good. Um, these are some classic visual uh, illusions and such. They will be nice for you to just warm yourself into this talk um, because they will introduce you to some of the fun things about vision. Uh, we study vision. We call ourselves vision scientists um, uh, within, within psychology. And um, this is something um, fun about vision. First thing I'm going to say is have a look at this square and that square. Do you mean which squares I'm talking about? Uh, do you know which squares I'm talking about? This one and that one. This one and that one. The light coming off from those squares and therefore the color and therefore the lightness level, whatever, uh, 
is identical. They, those two squares are exactly the same as each other. But you are misled by your visual system and by some tricks uh, here. Uh, the, the only trick, by the way, is the surround. You see, the surrounding bits. If I take the surrounding bits off, see what happens. I simply cut it out. I didn't do anything special, no tricks here. Okay? I'm not trying to fool you or anything, it's all true. Uh, go back, that's the surround. When the surround is around, <laughs> you actually perceive those squa squares to have very different colors. Uh, and yet they are indeed identical. If we move on to an, an even more striking example, now uh, this is so striking that I didn't believe it. Uh, you see the green spiral and the blue spirals? See, that's the green spiral and that's the blue spiral. Those green spirals and the blue sp spirals are identical. They're the same color. And the only reason why you're seeing it, seeing it that way is because the bits around it, you know, the orange bits, the purple bits, all those bits, uh, mislead your visual system because of what we call contrast effects. And in fact, because I didn't believe it, I went ahead, got myself a uh, Photoshop, and erased all the orange bits and the purple bits, all the bits around the green and the blue spirals, and here's what we get. I did it myself. No tricks. I deleted it. <laughs> Let's move on. Now, color is a wonderful thing. Color constancy is one of those wonderful uh, aspects of color vision. Color constancy is our ability to keep colors constant uh, regardless of the lighting. The lighting, for example, could be uh, morning lighting, where blue is dominant, or evening lighting, where orange is dominant. So the, 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 the illumination uh, uh, constantly changes throughout the day. Imagine yourself evolving um, on this planet, and light keeps changing. You, you can see something red in the morning, and that turns out to be gray in the evening or something. That's, that's a difficult uh, way to live. So the visual system has evolved in such a way that it keeps colors constant regardless of the quality of the illumination. And here's an example. This um, uh, left one, the left image here, uh, th this is all computer generated, but it simulates lighting conditions. Here, as you can see, there's a dominant yellow light, and on the right, there's a dominant blue light. Okay? Now, remember, there's no light or anything. This is computer generated, but your visual system right now, as you're looking at it, thinks that the image on the left is illuminated by a yellow lamp, if you like, and the image on the right is illuminated by a blue lamp. Okay? So once your visual system makes that inference, it is in our trap. It is misled. And here's how. You see that tile there, the blue one, and that tile there, the blue one, shown here. And also think about that tile there, the yellow one, and that tile there, the yellow one. Okay? The blue tiles here and the yellow tiles there. The light that is currently, as you're looking at it, being reflected from those blue and yellow tiles is actually colorless. It's gray. Gray light, I'll repeat myself, gray light is being reflected off this tile and gray light off this tile. They're identical, but one appears to be dark blue, the other appears to be yellow. You are misled, and let me prove it. I drew some rectangles in PowerPoint. You can all do this yourselves. I just drew some rectangles to cover up around the yellow tile. And as you can see, that's a gray. And I know some people won't believe me, so I'll just do this. Whoop. Yes, there you are. It's a yellow. I'll bring it back in if you don't believe me. It's a gray. Okay? That's color constancy. 
Why? What's happening here? The brain says, very briefly, the brain says, ooh, too much yellow light, too much yellow light, I must adjust. Something that appears to be gray to me, under normal circumstances, must actually be blue because there's too much li uh, yellow light. Okay? Um, why yellow versus blue? <clears throat> well, that's the opponent's system. That's a different issue. I'm not going to get into that right now. Uh, it's the visual systems, uh, one of uh, visual systems' most important properties. Okay, have a look at this. This is really good. Um, I'm again, at the back is far away, and the man at the front is near. Except that these are actually two dimensional images. I could just use a pair of scissors to cut this guy out, put him there. Use a pair of scissors to cut this guy out, and put him there. I could do that. It's two dimensional, but your now thinking is three dimensional. And as a result, here's what happens if I do cut this guy out, and put him somewhere strategic, this is what you see. It's the same guy, no trick. And to prove that, there you go. Here, you think that guy is big. You don't think it, you perceive him to be big. You don't consciously decide he's big because he, he's far. You kind of unconsciously or non-consciously decide that uh, he must be about that height because he's a guy and he's far, right? And then the actual image that falls on your retina from this guy, okay, so your retina is here and there's an angle coming from this guy to your retina, that image uh, on your retina is actually this size. But your visual system makes an adjustment, says, no, 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 this is too small. This guy is far. He must be bigger than this. And fools you into this. Uh, a similar effect is here. Again, I didn't believe this. I really did not believe this, so I took a pair of scissors and I cut it out. But here's what you get. Again, your visual system right now is fooled into thinking this is, this is a three-dimensional box, and so is that, okay? They're not. They're two-dimensional, uh, just lines on a piece of, on a plane. However, you now think they're three-dimensional, and as a result, again, your visual system is fooled. And how? The top surface of this box, the top surface, and the top surface of that box are identical. They appear to be incredibly different, but they're identical. I'll prove it to you as best as I can. Normally, I prove this by, by uh, getting a pair of scissors and cutting the top surfaces out and then putting them on top of each other and going, oh my god. But you can't do that right now. So instead, I did this. Okay. Now, look what happens when I make the three-dimensional cues disappear. Okay? You still don't believe me, but what I'll do is, ooh, where's the rotate button? Uh, is there a rotate button here? If I rotate this, hmm? tools. View toolbars. Rotating. Is there a rotating thing? No. Anyway, believe me, they are exactly the same. <laughs> On my machine, there's a rotate button, none here. But I'll tell you something. I drew this first. I, I pressed Control C, copy. I pressed, uh, pressed Control V, paste. I cloned it, I rotated it. That's all there is to it. I know you're going to have to take my word for it, but there you go. Again, you're fooled into thinking that this is far and this is near. And you're fooled into thinking that this is far, but not as far as this. And 
that results in all sorts of complicated um, uh, processes that, that lead you to think that those are very different shapes, but they're not. They're identical. And finally, I want to show you something. I like this. It has nothing to do with my color thing, but I like the, the interaction. Now, if you've seen this before, or if you work out the answer, don't say it, <laughs> please. Just raise your hand saying, I see it. OK, I'm going to ask you a question. Just answer it by raising your hand. Don't say anything. Don't say whatever it is. We're going to have fun. <clears throat> I'm going to show you a video in which, first, I'm going to ask you, is there something amiss, something different, something weird going on here, something that you've noticed? You have noticed it. There's one, two, three, four, five. It's all my students for some reason. <laughs> OK, let me ask you this. Can you see anything changing in this image? Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Only 13 or 14, OK. Yeah, it, it increases, but it took you like 30 seconds to see something as big as the engine of the airplane. How about this one? OK, I dare you to do this one. <laughs> Shh, konu shmak yok. OK, this is easier because you're now practiced. <laughs> and that's interesting, the practice effects and change blindness. The tree. I like the ah oh, when I do this. It's great. <laughs> OK, now let's come to color categories. Uh, I don't know how much time I've got left, actually, for all this. But good, half an hour. That's enough. Um, the physical wavelength continuum is a continuum. That's the point. Colors are um, continuously, continually changing uh, wavelengths, effectively. In fact, color doesn't exist in nature. Color is our experience of the light that is being reflected off an object. The object doesn't have color. The object simply reflects light. There's no such thing as colors in nature. It's all in our head. And not only that, but even though color continuum, co uh, the, the color spectrum is a continuum, it means that there are no sudden jumps. It's all equal intervals. Our perception is not equal interval perception. It's categorical. We see not a continuous change, but sudden jumps from red to orange, from orange to yellow, from yellow to green. Sudden jumps. Why? Why is it that we see colors categorically is, the, is one of the main questions of this, study, uh, of this presentation. Oh, yeah. Very good, very good, before I could even say it. Um, can you all see uh, the, the text? Because it's going to be basically it's going to be text from now on. Uh, but they, they need to see me on the camera. That's why we have to turn the lights on. Um, but if you have difficulty, just let us know, and we'll go back to the dark mode. <coughs> now, I'm going to have to inject a sort of semi-philosophical, semi-sociological, anthropological, even political discussion, debate. Linguistic relativity hypothesis. The radical form of it suggests that language is responsible for thought. Without language, we couldn't have thought. We couldn't think without language in the way that we do. And therefore, every uh, speaker of a language reflects the linguistic structure in their thought processes. So uh, speakers of different languages think differently. This was actually. Uh, 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 mainly a backlash to begin with in, in, in the early 20th century uh, to uh, people suggesting that um, Stone Age tribes that people started discovering in Papua New Guinea, etc., they were backward, that they were, they were somehow retarded. 
What they were saying is, no, 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 they have a different language, and that's why they think differently from you. This was a backlash. But that's not really must kind of an influence on thinking. Okay? And I'm basically here to question or test that theory. <clears throat> now, why color perception? What's that got to do with it? Well, uh, we just mentioned that color spectrum is perceived categorically. Different categories, bands of hues, rather than a, a continuous uh, scale. Now, we also, uh, in order to describe these bands of hues, we use linguistic terms, color terms, color names. We use language to define color categories. Perfect opportunity. If language determines or shapes or influences thought, and my language has different color words than you do, yours does, is it the case then that when I look at the rainbow, I see a different rainbow than you? Because language shapes thought, if language shapes thought, and since color, perceiving colors categorically is thought itself in its most basic, purest form, is it the case, then, that language might have an influence on the way we perceive the color spectrum? The, or, of course, the opposing view is, is it because of hardwired mechanisms? We're born that way, hardwired mechanisms. We're, you know, we, we, we see colors categorically because it's in our genes. And, and it's universal. Everywhere you go, all humans show the same color uh, categorical perception. But we should ask the question, if your language categories, uh, if your language categorizes, encodes colors differently, do you see the spectrum differently? Do you see, not name, but see the spectrum differently? Early on, people saw very many different languages with, with very, very different color categories. Okay? Uh, and I don't just mean different names. I mean, for example, in English there's red, in Turkish there's kırmızı, and they both mean the same thing. That's not different. That's not what I mean by different. What I mean is that I uh, call a certain area red, but uh, another language picks an area of red and an area of yellow and then calls it something else. That's the difference I'm talking about. Not just terminology difference, but actual encoding difference. Okay? And they observed that there were really weird colors. I mean, just think of khaki, haki, or fuchsia, whatever that is, or ördek başı yeşili, the green of a duck's head. Um, yeah, there are weird names. That's true. But then came along Berlin and K in 1969. This was a, a, a seminal study, if there was ever one. Uh, because it, it created not only a, a, a whole body of research after that, uh, but, but it, it also shifted the opinion dramatically. And uh, their main introduction was the idea of basic color terms. Yes, you can have very weird color names like Ordek Bashi Ishili or Haki or Fushia, but really what's important in language is its basic color terms. Basic color terms are psychologically salient. They come to mind easily. If I ask you, to write down all the color names you can think of, the first ones you'll write are red, blue, yellow, green, etc. Right? Not khaki. Unless you're trying to be a bit of a jerk. <laughs> uh, sometimes people do that to me, just to, just to have fun. It's all in good humor. Now, um, Berlin and Kay discovered that there were, when you looked at the basic terms of a language, there were remarkable similarities between languages. And they said, there you go. It's universal physiology. Universal, uh, because what happens is wherever you go, languages always evolve to the same color terms, same color categories. They're, they're always the same, because people are the same. Language doesn't determine color categories. Color categories are determined by physiology, which then determines language. That's what they argued, very successfully. Um, and in fact, they even proposed a, a, a language evolution uh, of 11 color terms, okay? They said, 
if a language, oh, by the way, they also observe, the, the way they do this is, uh, it's what's called the synchronic research. They, they got, uh, they didn't look at history, they couldn't have, but they, they got speakers of very different languages together, and they asked them how many color terms their language had. Some languages were really primitive. They only existed in Papua New Guinea, and they only had two color terms. Some had three, some had four, some had five. Never any more than 11, right? But uh, the point is this. Whenever they saw a language with two terms, it was always black and white. Whenever they saw a language with three terms, it was always black, white, and red. Whenever they saw a language with four terms, it was either black, white, red, green, or black, white, red, yellow, and so on and so forth. That's the way they built up their evolutionary theory. Then they modified it quite a bit, because there were languages that, that broke the rule. Uh, there were languages, for example, for which gray appeared here, whereas it's one of the most unimportant basic terms there is. Um, so gray was, was announced to be a wild card by the, uh, the Paul K team. But anyway, by and large, it's a good theory. It really is. Except there's one thing. Turkish has 12 basic color terms. <laughs> La Juvet. By the way, I'm going to have to ask you all to keep this quiet, because once you know this, you cannot be my subjects anymore in my experiments. Okay? I cannot use you as participants in my experiments, because you know this information. Um, but, uh, but so try and not talk about the large rat thing too much. <laughs> um, anyway, large rat is basic. How, how basic? Uh, well, if I ask you to write down all the color names you can think of, it comes really, to really high in the lists, like higher than gray, orange, gri, turunju, right? Um, if I ask kids what it is, they, know, they all know it, little kids. Um, I know some of you are going to argue, oh, it's the Fenerbahce thing, but <laughs> forget it. That's not an argument, and, and we, can, we can talk about that, but anyway. Um, so, Turkish has an extra basic term. Other languages have less. As, as I said, Berlin and Kay acknowledged this. They said that's how they did their research. In fact, they said if there were a, a language with four terms only, it's black, white, red, and green. So, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's important for uh, our purposes in the next few slides. Some other languages have fewer than 11 basic color terms. For example, Setswana spoken in Botswana as five. How do they do it? Well, uh, they have uh, a term uh, botala. Okay? Botala means uh, the color of the sky and the color of the, of the grass. Okay? Uh, right, Oliver? Am I wrong about this? I've never been to Botswana. You've never been to Botswana, but you've been to Namibia, which is coming up. Um, Oliver is in our department and works in this field. And um, uh, botala What's the color of the sky? You ask them, and they say, Watala. What's the color of the grass? It's Watala. I know some of you are smiling and thinking, ooh, how primitive. But, but, think about this. I can show you a color, and you'll all say, La Javat. I can show you a color, and you'll all say, it's Mavi. I can then ask David the same question, and he'll call them both blue. How primitive indeed. <laughs> I'm kidding. There's nothing primitive about it. It's just, you know, we're more evolved. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, it's all a joke. It's all in good humor. So, if you go to Namibia, uh, the Himba living there, Oliver has met them, has worked with them. Um, uh, God bless his soul. And... Um, they have a single term, ochiburo. How do you pronounce that? Do you know? Buru. Buru. Ochiburu for purple, blue, and green. One term to mean purple and blue and green. No categorical distinction. So, the thing is, since we have these differences between different languages, what we can do is now look at the perception of people speaking those languages. That's what's important to us. Remember, I'm not a linguistic relativity hypothesis researcher or anything. I'm, I'm a perceptual psychologist. I want to know if perception is flexible enough to adapt to one's language. Now, let's operationally define what I mean by li linguistic influences or categorical perception of color. 
categorical perception of color, can we have the lights off just for a second, is such that two stimuli of equal distance uh, as, the, as the rest of the pairs, uh, uh, spanning a category boundary. In this case, it's green to blue. I know the colors don't look so good, but it's difficult to calibrate and stuff like that, so forgive that. But these are all, all green, and those are all blue, supposedly. Oops, I don't know what's happening here. But um, there's a category boundary here, blue-green boundary. Now, this pair is what's called a cross-category pair. And this pair is what's called the within-category pair. It, it happens inside a category. Now, cat categorical perception is that people find it easier to discriminate colors coming from different categories as opposed to colors coming from the same category, even though the distances are equal. Now, this last part, even though the distances are equal, is a, a real problematic sentence. And uh, Oliver and I know this, but I'm not going to go into that. But, but how do you equate the distances thing? That's like it's taking us years to figure this out, to, to figure that methodological problem out. But anyway, that's what CP is. Cross category better than within category. Now, we can look at CP in one language versus in another language. That's what we can do, right? And we can do other things too. For example, we can ask people, um, uh, to rate the similarity of different colors. We can ask Africans, uh, the Himba or the Turks versus the English speakers, how similar do you think these colors are? And of course, as you can see, uh, there could be a cross-category pair or a within-category pair. And what the CP theory would suggest that cross-category pair will be rated more different than within-category pair uh, uh, by uh, whoever has that category in their language. There, this is another um, uh, paradigm. I'm going to go over this fast because I don't have much time left. But this is the most commonly used one, same different judgments. This is what we do in, in psychology a lot of the time in cognitive psychology. We show something. We have an interstimulus interval, a gap. And then we show something else. And then we say, were these two things same or different? Simple. Now. Using these, I'm going to go over these pretty quickly, using, using these kinds of methods, especially same different judgments, similarity judgments, that sort of thing, we have observed some differences between, say, speakers of some African languages um, uh, and, and English speakers. Okay? But A, I don't have the time to go into that because I want to talk about my stuff, and B, those are always a little problematic because you're dealing with uh, the, 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 the likes, uh, the, the people who, uh, who look like that picture that you've just seen, you know, the Himba, for example, it's not very viable to go to them and, and say, um, click this button if it's same, click that button if it's different. It just doesn't have any mundane reality. Okay? So it's always difficult. And um, Turks and, comparing Turks and Brits are uh, a little easier. Um, and, uh, but, um, again, I'm not going to talk too much about that. Oh, right, yes, you need lights. But <clears throat> the main thing I want to mention today is the following, and I find this very interesting. Is color perception changeable? Is it flexible? Is it adaptable? Does it change? Remember, what we're arguing is, I see colors categorically, is it because it's hardwired, or is it because language modified the way I see the world? If language is to modify the way you see the world, then the way you see the world should be modifiable, okay? specifically colors. Now, uh, one thing that uh, I was kind of building all this upon is uh, uh, rich literature in psychology, amazing stuff. Uh, if you're interested in this kind of thing, Go ahead and put these keywords in, perceptual learning. Perceptual learning is an improved ability to perceive. It's learning to see things that you weren't able to see before through practice, repeated, repeated practice. You will all have seen examples of this. For example, um, uh, give me a couple of different red wines. I'll taste them and I'll go, mm, yeah, okay, they're, they're nice. Um, and, but uh, a, a professional wine taster might say, 
um, not even, you know, never mind the different makes or brands or whatever, but uh, the actual year that it comes from, they're able to distinguish and make such fine distinctions that we aren't able to. It's not that we don't know what to call them, it's just that we cannot make the distinction. But through practice, we start being able to see the difference. One good example is radiographers. When they look at radiography uh, uh, x-ray images, uh, they have to spot an atypical cell. Okay, that cell is really tiny, and ordinary people don't even see anything there. But the uh, specialist does through years of practice. We have shown in our labs that you can actually train people um, to learn what radiographers have learned over years in the laboratory over a matter of maybe weeks. Okay? So psychologists actually sometimes do good practical jobs as well. <clears throat> so what I did is I got people to do those same different judgments, remember? Same or different, same or different. That for four days they steadily improved and then what I did is I trained half of them with green colors, greens, lots of greens, same different, same different, or the other half, lots of blues, same different, same different, and then I switched the color sets. The reason for that is, was to show that this wasn't some sort of expertise building, some sort of, yeah, I got used to the task, I can do this well, I get better at the task. No, it wasn't. It was they got better in discriminating a certain set of colors, which did not transfer to a different set of colors, which shows, um, if you're interested in the visual system, the, the lower level, the more basic in the visual system you go, the more specific effects are learning is. Okay? So this was a specific effect, specific to blue or specific to green. And then what I did is I put people in the lab. Okay, I gave them, why is this moving so? Um, sorry. No, not that. No, not that. There's, there's uh, animation here which isn't supposed to be, and I'm just trying to see custom animation. Cancel. There isn't anything. Anyway, let's look at it this way. So, here's the task. I give them the screen. Okay, to begin with, there are no colors here. A single color appears. All the colors that appear are blue. But I ask the subjects, I don't even tell them anything. Nothing conceptual. It's all perceptual. I, uh, I ask them to look at each color and put them on the left or on the right. Now, if two colors go together, that's okay. They made the correct response. If, on the other hand, this color, for example, belongs not here but there, then they get a, feed, uh, a piece of feedback saying wrong. Okay? So it's a straight category learning paradigm. What they did is they did this over three, four days in my lab, each taking about an hour and a half. Okay? Thousands of trials of going left, right, left, right, right, left. They, they learned a new category that didn't exist between two types of blue. They have, you have blue versus green. You have green versus yellow, but you don't have blue versus another kind of blue. Okay? So, um, so I trained them across many days, uh, many trials rather, uh, to make that distinction. And then, remember though, remember though that this distinction that they're making is simple naming. It's just like asking yourself, is this Mavi? No, it's Lajavet. Is this Lajavet? Yes, it's Lajavet. Just the lab analogy of that same thing. And um, <clears throat> so again, there's a green group and a blue group. Okay, I trained them on this naming. Okay, and then what I did is I picked points in this area where they trained. They trained randomly across this area, but there's a boundary here, and then I picked a set of colors, and what I did is I did same different judgments. And this, this bit is kind of slightly confusing, but, but it's going to be rewarding, so I'm just going to uh, emphasize this. 
A same different judgment. How? This one versus this one. That's one pair. Or this one versus that one. That's another pair. As you can imagine, this pair is a cross-category pair, and that pair is a within-category pair. The cross-category pair, I remind you, is only cross-category because I <coughs> arbitrarily in the lab across three, four days to learn this new novel category boundary. And then I tested them on the same different judgment task. As you can see, uh, the solid line is category learners. Category learners improved on the across category trials. In fact, they improve, improved hugely compared to controls. They improved hugely compared to controls. That's not a significant difference. Okay, so category learners improved. This is same different judgments, remember? They're now more able to see the difference between two types of blue than they were before they came to my lab. And the final point is, do I have uh, time for a final point? Five minutes. Oh, great, I have more than enough. So, so what I'm saying, if, that, if, if I have that time, let me, let me just sort of recap. What I'm saying here is, forget the, the details of category learning and same different judgments, etc. What I'm saying is this. Just like I demonstrated in the lab, in life, you would have a situation where a kid growing up might start going, Mom, is this Mavi? And Mom says, no, just like my program says no. Is this Mavi? Yes. That's correct feedback. Okay? Now, imagine the kid growing up after a while starts, let's go back uh, to this. After a while, the kid says, okay, these are easy. I figured those out, right? But these are a bit difficult. The ones in the middle, is it really blue? Is it really green? If it's more difficult, you pay more attention. If you pay more attention, and um, let's talk a little uh, neural uh, language here, more neurons are recruited. They, more neurons uh, are dedicated to the task of distinguishing between the two colors. So your brain gets better equipped. It's a physiological change we're talking about. Okay? And that could well be a mechanism through which language can shape our perception. Um, there's one problem. Remember the task I used to do this? Same different, when I, when I, when I say I used to do this, I mean I used to test if people can perceive better now or something, um, is the same different judgment task. Now there's a five second gap here. Some people argued very successfully that what might be happening is you see a color, say in the, in the classic uh, task, blue-green boundary, blue-green uh, uh, across category, the blue-green boundary is better than blue-blue. Remember that? That's, that's categorical perception. So what they're saying is, in fact, some of them even without realizing they're saying this, what they're saying is, uh, what's happening is with the five-second gap, you see a blue and you go, ooh, there's five seconds in which I have to keep it in my head. I'm not perceiving anymore, I'm remembering, okay? Uh, five seconds, ooh, what do I do, what do I do? Blue, 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 blue. I verbally label it. It's nothing to do with perception. I use a verbal strategy. And then five seconds later, a green comes up and you go, aha, that's green, that was blue, because I kept saying blue, 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 and so there you go, I'm better at it. Whereas if there are two blues of equal length, if there are two blues, it's ruining my surprise, um, then you go blue, 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 and then you see another blue, but because you've only said blue, you go, this is blue, that's blue, so same. And you're wrong, okay? That's how you can explain categorical perception. So I hated having this five-second gap. I wanted to get rid of it. And I came up with this new method. Here, the two colors are presented side by side. Side by side. No gap, not even spatial, let alone temporal. 
and then a backward mask to destroy those who are familiar with cognitive psychology will know that there's something called uh, an iconic memory or sensory register or whatever that keeps stimuli in there for a fraction of a second, even to destroy that. This is basically, you know, when you, uh, when I say something and I stop, you can almost still hear the word stop, right? It stays there for a fraction of a second. That's what I mean by iconic memory. Um, to destroy that, I use the backward mask. Now, the task is this. Two pairs here, two pairs there. One of the two pairs contains a difference. I don't know if you can see this, but these two are different. The question is, which one is different? The answer is that one. Okay, so no memory component. And I measured thresholds. This is my new invented boundary. Remember, arbitrary. I, 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 I taught people, trained people on this boundary that didn't exist before. And this is my new within category and new within category, new cross category. I measured thresholds, perceptual thresholds uh, here. Threshold is basically how much difference do you need before you can actually see it. Just noticeable difference is another word for it. And it turns out, <coughs> red bars, I hope my students are listening to this, red bars show before training, yellow bars after training. As you can see, in my invented arbitrary within category trials, no change. After, before training and after training. Training, tra training is simply going left, right, left, Right, categorizing, without even knowing why, okay? Here, on the other hand, across category thresholds, after training, thresholds are much lower, which meant that people required much less to be able to detect a difference between two colors after training, only for cross-category trials and not for within-category trials. Once I developed this technique, I did something else which I don't even believe, but there you go, I've got it. I, I found some Africans living uh, in England, and of course I found plenty of English people, and uh, I compared them using my new threshold method. And there was only one significant difference between Africans and Brits, and that was on the blue-green boundary, where these Africans didn't have a boundary. Uh, those Africans that I tested have um, one term, like Botala, both meaning blue and green. Okay, whereas Brits do. And uh, that's the only significant difference. Could be explained by other things, but for now, as I say, I don't believe it. It's so controversial. But uh, we'll see. We'll see what we can do. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much for listening. You've been great. <laughs> Thank you very much, Emre. Uh, the time is pretty much up. We finish at half past one on these occasions. So though I am myself bursting with questions, I'm afraid we don't have time for questions. Thank you for that very interesting and, I should say, colourful talk. <laughs> <laughs> I will invite you all back here in four weeks' time, the 3rd of December. Uh, Ura Haifa, the Assistant Director of the New Kenji Computing Centre, will be our third and final speaker for uh, this semester. And this evening, at 6 o'clock, this new exhibition, art exhibition, uh, will be opening and you will be invited back to the opening of that. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Ben teşekkür ederim. Thanks